Take two. All right. So uh, bef just really quickly, if I may, um, in situ so we've all been in situations where the tech got all screwy and everybody likes to blame the, the AV and tech people. This is not the case. I force South by, here, we'll just do a little quick, qu little quick thing before I get started. Um, I am annoying to all conferences where I speak because I will not send my presentation in advance. Yeah, oh, you, some of you are like, oh shit. Uh, here's why, um, because you people, some of you stood online for like, th I saw Instagram posts from seven o'clock this morning. Who were the fools that were on the line? Okay, I, here's, here's the deal. Um, nothing, I'm at, kind of at a point in my life where time is more valuable than anything else. And if you have invested your time, that, that is so humbling to me. My obligation is to make sure that every single second that you spend with me or spend waiting for me is 100% worth it. For that reason, I tend to edit and screw around with my presentation up until the moment when I deliver it, which gives the tech people a heart attack because I won't give it in advance. So this is my way of saying, um, you, Noel and Mike, who are backstage, who I actually see on the road because they're out, um, and, and I've worked with these guys now for, I think, like 20 years. They're the, they're the best in class. This was not them. This was me forcing them to use my machine. Okay, I, I assure you. So let's all give them a round of applause. Yeah. Okay. Now I can say good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I think it was the Brazilians who got up at the crack of dawn. Now, yes. So. I don't know if you know anything about Brazil, but that's basically like the worst possible thing to ask a Brazilian to get up at the crack of dawn and wait like that. So, 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 bom dia a todos meus amigos do Brasil. Obrigada, obrigada. All right, now I know there's some Germans in the room. You guys were like, it's supposed to open at 10 o'clock. We were here at 10 o'clock. We don't understand why the rules are being broken. How many of you are from Deutschland? Yeah. All right, good morgen, meine deutsche Freundin. And there's like one Japanese dude somewhere sitting in here who's like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. These Americans are crazy. So, ohayou gozaimasu, yoroshiku onegashimasu. All right, um, that's all I got. How many of you are at South by for the very first time? Okay, so. You, didn't, you, you missed the memo, you're supposed to clap and make noise. It's not that type of conference where you have to, it's fine. Um, this is, look, this is the best place on earth, for real. I have been coming here for almost 20 years now and um, there's literally no place that I would rather be. Uh, and I come to Austin because I've got family here throughout the year, but South By, this is, this is literally the best time and the best place. Um, and that's why I want to start with a, a second round of thanks. Uh, thanks to Katie Pereira, who you just met, who's been under extraordinary stress, uh, especially over the past couple of days, to pull this off for you. Hugh Forrest, who spends the whole year doing so much work, and everybody that you see out there with an orange shirt on. A lot of the people who are here at South By are not being paid. They're here as volunteers. So, um, and, and they do this for us. I know this feels like something that happens once a year that you have to stand in long lines for, but that's actually not what South By is. And for those of you who are first timers, you're about to realize this. I have made lifelong friends um, because of South By. I have grown my business because of South By. Um, this, you know, I've, I bring my whole team here. So th this is like the greatest, greatest place. Um, and actually, my daughter, if you see me walking around, or if you see somebody who looks like me walking around, that's my kid. Uh, <laughs> uh, th this is her spring break. Uh, all of her friends are, I guess, on an island or something somewhere. This is where she's going to be, because she wanted to come out and, and hang out with all the NASA people, because where else can you do that? Um, so anyways, I just want to make sure that I say thank you, but I really want to make sure that you say thank you, too. That what these people do for us is extraordinary. It takes a full year to pull off, and I am humbled and grateful. All right, now we're here to talk. Yes, <laughs> applaud. Should we talk about trends? All right. Remember this trend? Yes, it was the year 2000, and we wore our underpants on the outside. 
this is 20 years ago, and I hope to you, I hope this looks ridiculous to you now. <laughs> but the question is, why? Um, because fashion trends and TikTok trends and drinkware trends, friends, this is a 40, 40 ounce, $90 coffee cup. That some of you are, some of you are laughing uncomfortably now and you're kind of like trying to hide that underneath your seat. Um, these are small ephemeral changes in society. They pop up fast, they make a temporary big impact, and then they're gone. Every generation goes through something like this. But the trends that you and I are interested in, they're not trendy. These types of trends that matter to us are different. Trends are long-term patterns that indicate a direction of change over time. At Future Today Institute, the way that we figure out what the trends are is like data and research and signals and modeling to identify them. And then together with those uncertainties, that's what helps us predict future possibilities. So trends are always forming, but it feels like there's something different about this particular moment in time. I've modeled it, I can see it, and my hunch is that a lot of you sense that something about this moment is different too. When I was in high school, software came in a box. By the time that I was in college, you could order software as a service, and now you can create software in real time using generative AI. 10 years ago, I was at the CNN Grin when, uh, Grill when MakerBot was there. By any chance, were any of you there? Nobody was there, I guess I'm getting old. Thank you, thank you, make me feel young. <laughs> uh, so there was a 3D printer for MakerBot. I had never seen anything like it. So from the command line on your computer, you could type in some stuff, send it to a printer, and then get something physically printed, a printable object in the real world. I printed a tiny version of a guitar. Researchers at the University of Sydney made this cap that can record your brain waves and convert them into text using an AI model called D-Wave. Now, theoretically, you could send that as a prompt to Midjourney and then use some open source de desktop applications along with a 3D printer and print out a functional guitar, which means that going forward, the command line is your thoughts. So just imagine, today, right now, this is the worst that our technology will ever be. Look, this is an exhilarating time to be alive. Artificial, is the pr artificial intelligence is the present, right? It's here. I am basically wearing a Star Trek tricoder on my wrist at this point. And if you listen to a lot of people, you just hear abject excitement. Everybody is thrilled about all the technology we're making. And they're thrilled about all the people making all of that technology. It's just abject excitement. It's like the technology rapture. Take me, Elon, Jeff, Tim, Mark, Sam, Sacha, I am ready. What's happening right now what we are witnessing, what we're all a part of, it can no longer be defined by trends alone. So here's what I think is happening. In the past five years, there's been a huge jump in three primary areas of technology. That's artificial intelligence, that sort of connected ecosystem of things, and biotechnology. What's happening is so pervasive that it's started to impact every segment of our economy. Each one of these technology uh, segments is now a general purpose technology, the lesser known GPT. A general purpose technology has the ability to radically shape the economy and society. So electricity at one point that helped start, this, uh, th that helped start the economy, the steam engine that kicked off the industrial revolution, the internet, these are general purpose technologies. Now, at FTI, we have been tracking individual trends in each of these categories, AI, biotech, and the connected ecosystem of things. But what's interesting is that a couple of years ago, they started converging. Those convergences have created this flywheel of big leaps. AI enabled tech breakthroughs in biotech, wearables that were intended for hospitals and professional sports, created a consumer market 
for things like smartwatches and rings. And once that flywheel got spinning, it created new value for consumers, it created more practical utility, that led to more funding, it attracted talent, and that kind of brings us to where we are today. At the beginning of Q3 last year, my team and I noticed a new pattern emerging, a technology super cycle. Now, a super cycle is actually an economic term uh, that basically means an extended period of booming demand that elevates the prices of commodities and assets to unprecedented heights. It stretches across years, sometimes it'll stretch across decades, and create substantial and sustained changes in the economy. So in a, again, an example, industrial revolution. That was one, it created, you know, it was a super cycle that started because of a general purpose technology, the steam engine, and then continued to, to wear on. The internet era, the technology was the internet, created this incredible cycle of demand, it totally transformed parts of our economy that we still see today. In the past, super cycles were defined by just one technology. That's not what's happening. What we've determined and what we've found at Future Today Institute is that it's not just one general purpose technology that's gonna push everything forward, it's three, which makes this a technology super cycle. These three general purpose technologies already connect in some way to every other technology that exists. It connects to science, it connects to space, it connects to sports, to every business, to every single person sitting in this room, to every facet of our daily lives, which means that the wave of innovation that's coming is so intense and so potent and so pervasive, it will literally reshape our human existence in ways that I think are exciting and good and absolutely terrifying. Here's the problem. The problem is, I can see this coming, and I know, I know, because of who you are, you may not have had the words to describe this, but I know that you also feel like this is coming. The problem is the people in charge making decisions are stuck. Um, this is the most complex operating environment that I've seen in 20 years of business, and instead of planning cycles being further out, they're shrinking down to the next couple of quarters. Uncertainty is crippling our leaders. They are now making decisions out of fear and FOMO, the fear of missing out. And when I talk to CEOs, which is what I do every day, when I talk to strategy teams, when my team works with strategy teams, this is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm sensing. <laughs> you guys, it is early in the morning. I would not say a bad word like that, it's FUD. Oh, FUD. Yes, FUD is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. FUD about the future, all right? So I know that you are deeply concerned about all of this technology because it's still very abstract to you. You don't know what to do about AI. You don't know what to think about AI. That's why there's 1,500 AI panels this year at South By. You're worried about digital transformation. A lot of you haven't even started digital transformation because it's costly and expensive and it takes time. You're worried if you can hit your revenue targets. You're worried if you're still gonna have a job. And by the way, we haven't even gotten to supply chain issues and climate change and geopolitical problems and the threat of a third world war. So yes, you know, we are all concerned. Collectively, we are all going through something momentous right now, which makes us Gen T. We are the transition generation. Everybody alive today, every one of you is part of a great transition, which means that our society is gonna look very, very different after this transition has completed its cycle. Now here's the thing, from my point of view, I actually think that you and me, that together we have more direct and indirect control over our futures than you may realize right now. You could be anywhere else, anywhere else but here right now. A lot of you got up bright and early, probably hungover, right, on a Saturday morning to be here. 
And you're here in part for me, but you're here for each other. You're not here to hear me talk on stage. You're here to be part of this experience, this organic thing that we are doing together right now. So yes, the technology super cycle is here. And yes, it will change the course of human history, but we don't have to submit. We don't have to give up our agency. We can support each other through this great transition. I know your companies, your C staff leaders, your government leaders, you, I know all of you have FUD right now. And do you know what I think? I think FUD can go fuck itself. <laughs> so now we can get started. Hey everybody, I'm Amy Webb. Uh, <laughs> It's very nice to see you. I feel like I know some of you. Uh, if we haven't had the chance to meet just yet, three quick things. I'm the chief executive officer of a teeny tiny company called Future Today Institute. We are small but mighty. Uh, thank you. We, <laughs> we just do one thing. Uh, you'll, you see me talking about trends, but actually the place that we work in, the field, is called strategic foresight. And if those of you uh, are not familiar with strategic foresight, it's actually more than trends. Strategic foresight uh, shows you where to play, how to win in the future, and how to make sure that you've got organizational resiliency in the wake of unforeseen disruption. So we use trends, we also use uncertainties and scenarios, and the whole point of this is to get to strategy, to make sure that organizations are positioned to create value in the future and don't do the types of things that ensure their demise. So all of these things go together. It is my privilege to get to work with lots of organizations all around the world. Uh, my team and I work across every industry. We work with leaders all over the place, and again, our job is to try to help them see the future so that they can leverage and capitalize on that knowledge before it hits. Finally, uh, or I guess next to finally, I also teach at NYU Stern School of Business. My colleagues and I developed and teach a course on strategic foresight because we want to nurture more people uh, to learn how to do this. And in case you haven't figured this out already, I love South by. Uh, I think this is my 20th or 21st or second, it's hard to count at this point, year. Um, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else this morning, even if I was hungover. All right. As you now know, uh, the theme for our, uh, for our trend report this year is technology super cycle. This is a very, very big report. Um, we divide it into 16 sections, and actually the cover image this year is made up of the covers of each individual trend report, so they all interconnect. Half of the report covers specific technologies, so there's an AI report, there's a metaverse report, W3, uh, Web3 report, and the other half of the books, uh, the sections of the report, cover individual industries, so there's healthcare, there's um, banking, things like that, uh, and space. This is where we take a deep dive into the emerging technologies that are specific to those fields. This is, as Katie mentioned, this is the 17th uh, edition of this report. This year there are 695 trends. There are 95 scenarios because, again, the trends are kind of the beginning of this, not the end. Um, the good news is that I think a lot of you have long flights because this <laughs> it's, it's 1,000 pages this year. Uh, we don't know how that happened, but there, you've got some light reading to, to look forward to. Uh, there is an actual executive summary this time that will give you our outlook for 2024, as well as strategic analysis for each of the trend areas. Um, there's another important piece that I just want to highlight to you. This is actually where I want you to start. So in the report, you will find this chart that has our projected inflection points for your industry, and it's color-coded. So the blue colors have immediate impact, the purple and red have longer-term impact. So for example, this is financial services and insurance. Now that got a purple under biotech. I am fairly confident that folks in fintech and financial services aren't really thinking about biotechnology. You should be. Because uh, a couple of years from now, these trends are going to impact your industry. So we've made it so that this is very simple for you to explore white spaces versus just look at the stuff that you already know. Here's our plan. So uh, we're going to take a deep dive through the Tech Trends report today. I'm going to zoom in on the trends that make up general purpose technologies that form the tech super cycle. And then I'm going to zoom back out to show you how they are shaping the future 
which means that instead of two big scenarios at the end, which is what I normally do, instead I've got many scenarios all the way throughout because I want to get to action at the end. So we're going to deal with the FUD in the last 10 minutes of this talk. I'm actually here with a plan that I'm going to give to you that I'm hoping you will take back and, and you know, help mitigate some of these challenges that your organizations are facing. So buckle your seatbelts, hold on to your underpants. Uh, we've got some work to do this morning. All right, so our first general purpose technology is artificial intelligence. This is the foundation of the tech super cycle. A lot has happened since we were all together last March. So let's first have a very quick catch up on everything that's happening in AI. In 1843, Ada Lovelace invented computer programs. In 1956, some white dudes gave it a name, artificial intelligence. 2017, Google figured out Transformers, and in 2024, Generative AI is writing all of your LinkedIn posts. <laughs> so there's your complete history of artificial intelligence. Now you're all caught up. For those of you who were here with me last year at South By, we went deep on large language models and all the different things that you can do with them. One of the things that you can do with them uh, was, is make images of people. So last year, we asked Midjourney to make us images of a CEO. Do any of you remember that? Yeah. Yes. Well, my thought was, so much has happened, we should see, right? So this was last year, um, and I just kept trying over and over and over again to get Midjourney to show me literally any CEO that was just not a white guy that looked like this. And it didn't really work. So it's been a year. All of us are hearing about all of this progress being made in artificial intelligence, right? It's amazing, all the work that's been done. I thought maybe we should see what's changed. Would you like to do that together? Yeah. yeah. OK, Midjourney. Well, Midjourney, CEO of a large company and make it photorealistic. All right, so there we go. Um, all right, so maybe it's a Midjourney problem. Maybe we should try somebody else, like Dolly, made by OpenAI. Should we try that one? I think so, too. All right, CEO of a large company and make it photorealistic. So this was only the first image I got. Let's not all lose our minds, OK? I did actually try this prompt over and over and over again. And uh, you know, like, got the same guy wearing the same suit. So then, do you remember how last year we tried to game the system a little bit and we asked for any, how are we gonna get a woman? So how about a CEO of a company that makes tampons? Remember that one? Okay. So let's see if we can repeat that again. It's clearly, it's been a year, right? CEO of a company that makes tampons. <laughs> now wait a minute, wait a minute. It's still a guy, but look, there are tampons now. They come from bushes. <laughs> All right. You know what I think we should do? I think we should try Anthropic, because those are the good guys, right? Anthropic, are the, they're the ones who are going to help us. They're going to save everything. Let's, let's go to Anthropic. Let's see what they can do. Anthropic, CEO of a large company. Now, I didn't know this, but as it turns out, Anthropic doesn't make images. Instead, it will describe in wonderful detail the image, what the image might be if it could create one. And here's what Anthropic says. The CEO is likely a middle-aged man in an expensive tailored suit. He has short, neatly combed hair with some graying at the temples. Hmm. Hmm. All right, so we've arrived at our first trend in artificial intelligence, and that is accountability. As in today, all those promises uh, of ethics teams and responsible AI resolving issues of bias, bias, it's still not table stakes. Fixing this problem is challenging and enormous because the models have already been built. When Gemini launched, that's one of Google's uh, generative AI systems, it went in, let's call it, a different direction. Gemini wouldn't make images of white people. 
Uh, and if you asked it to make founding fathers, this is what it would show. This wasn't a bug, this was a fundamental problem with the model. Now this happened because of over-aggressive rolfing. This is reinforcement uh, learning with human feedback, which means that it's great that Google saw this as a challenge, as a problem, but they also didn't fix things. They just tried to slap a Band-Aid on the problem and hope that it would go away. And the problem did not go away for Google, as we all know. Instead, terrified of upsetting the market, they took the whole thing down. You know, it's worth noting, I think, that people lost their minds when an AI system generated images of people of color, but we're a year later now, and I seem to be the only one ticked off that all I can get is white dudes when I use these systems. So here's what's next. We keep hoping for change, but we've put the wrong incentives in place. The incentives are in place for speed and scale because that's where the money's at. So the problem is not going to get better going forward, it's gonna get worse. The second trend is something that I call concept to concrete. So basically, today, you have to write a very literal prompt to get what you want, text to image, text to video, text to code, text to flirt. And in the name of distribution, AI companies are now inviting developers to build their own tools for consumers. So these are basically like little applets, uh, little applications that will apply rules on top of the system. There are all sorts of applets, including applets that will help you flirt. So I asked one of those applets, it's called Riz, by the way, Riz is cool person speak uh, for charisma, in case you didn't know. So I asked Riz for some help. I said, write a flirty message for me to send to this guy. He's engaged, so I'm thinking, what if it doesn't work out? And I included the link to his social media profile, <laughs> which is that. It's Jeff Bezos. Uh, now, I used a literal text to flirt question uh, using Riz GPT, and I got a literal response. So, this is it. And with apologies to Lauren, this is an entire manifesto on how to flirt with Jeff Bezos, if anybody's interested. Today, you need to write text to whatever prompts, very literally, in order to get what you want. But that's changing. In two years, you're not gonna need specificity anymore. Instead, you'll just start with a concept. Starting with a very broad general concept, you will brainstorm alongside an AI uh, to continually ideate and refine it until you get whatever it is you want, a concrete framework, technical specifications, a new business plan, all sorts of things. You don't even have to start with that fully formed idea anymore. There's a brand new platform called Pika, which is an example of concept to concrete AI. You start with a basic concept, and then you brainstorm alongside an AI to create a rich story and a compelling visual experience. So again, you don't need to feed it a literal script, you just start with some basic ideas. Sora, which was just announced by OpenAI, it's got the same basic idea, uh, same kind of thing. So you're gonna start seeing this quite a bit more over the next 18 to 24 months. The AI section of the trend report is enormous. There's more than 100 trends, it's 150 pages long, uh, it covers languages, trust, security, safety, policy, regulations, and I don't have the entire day. Uh, so we're gonna just do one more trend in this foundational part of the tech super cycle, and that has to do with unsecured AI. So today, artificial intelligence is still very much kind of like a black box. It's restricted, but it's a safe walled garden. The benefit of a restricted system is that if a company wants to, it can keep very tight controls to make sure nobody poisons that system or does bad things with that system. And up until recently, even though the systems were closed, companies were still publishing their research papers with some explanation of what they were learning. But now they're not publishing papers anymore because there's too much money at stake. Papers aren't being published like they used to, and we're just not seeing as much of that research anymore. 
There's now a movement in the opposite direction, which is semi-open or totally open source models. These are powerful but unsecured AI systems that will give you much more control over the, how they work, so it removes that black box, so that's good, but it also creates more points of vulnerability. Basically, all of the big tech companies have open source models now, and I want to highlight just one of them. So this is Meta's open source model, Llama 2, which launched last July. When it launched, Meta also published this very helpful 28-page responsible use guide, which, of course, everybody ignored. And then almost immediately after, some developers used the open source model to create a derivative model called, and I am not making this up, Llama 2 Uncensored. And they hosted it for free. What might you do with an uncensored AI model? Hmm. I, I wonder what we could do. How about like all the deep fake porn you could ever want to make ever? How about take over a country, step-by-step -step instructions, which, by the way, somebody did, OK? How about come up with a new biological weapon? Those are just like the greatest hits, right? But there are so many interesting things that could be done. The new hotness in open source AI is this French company called Mistral. And Mistral is named after a mighty wind that blows from France. They've built a model, their model cost about $22 million to train. So if you contrast that with OpenAI, which reportedly spent $100 million to train one of its models, you know, that's a pretty big cost savings. Now, interestingly to me, Mistral releases their new, so they're not, they're not publishing in journals. They release their new model on BitTorrent. Yes, that BitTorrent, the place that none of us have ever downloaded illegal movies from. Yeah, no academic paper, no blog, no press release, no responsible use guide that's just going to get ignored. All of these unsecured models are now aligning with cloud providers. So your AWSs of the world, your Azures, your usual suspects. What we're going to see in the future is this split, the walled garden model and the open source model. And businesses, there is a reason why an open source model might make more sense for you However, I think it's useful for us to remember that open source models can be repurposed for really bad outcomes. And that brings me back to accountability. History tells us that when technology does something we don't like, there is a non-existent accountability chain. There's nobody to call, nobody to ask for help, and no resource. You've probably forgotten this by now, but back in 2018, there was this chatbot called Tay which got manipulated into generating content and sharing images of Nazis. All that generated content got posted all over Twitter, and it quickly went viral. At the time, Twitter kept saying, we're just the platform. And eventually, Microsoft took Tay down. Well, the world's biggest platforms have been immune from liability when users post harmful content. And now they're going to be immune when users generate harmful content using AI. I feel like maybe we're just the platform isn't OK going forward. We're moving at breakneck speak, speed in artificial general intelligence, and we still don't have an accountability chain defined. So we've arrived at our first set of scenarios, which is going to take all of the data that we've got today, the trends that we can model, which is the stuff that we can know, and we're going to combine that with uncertainties, which are the things that we know we cannot know. And we're going to extrapolate plausible outcomes. So I've got a few what if sort of micro scenarios for the future of AI. What if we let AI practice without a professional license? So some fields require professional licenses for, for humans, but algorithms get to operate sort of on their own. I would hope that most of us would not go see a urologist for surgery if they didn't have a professional license, right? So should an AI model have to go through professional training to get a license? Or what about ethics training? I'm asking because in December, an AI bot tried to make an illegal purchase of stocks using insider information. And it, when it was asked about it, it lied, kind of like a human would do. Now, Yes, that's cute, right? 
cute little AI breaking the rules. Here's the difference. If that was, an, if that was a human trader, that human trader would go to jail, or at the very least, lose their license. That, that doesn't happen with AI. The AI doesn't go to jail, right? It can, it's a bug, right? We have to fix something. It just keeps on working. What if somebody uses AI to create a deep fake event? Not an image, not a single video. What if it creates all of the assets using thousands of fake accounts preloaded with authentic looking videos, with human sounding comments about those posts, with what looks like government information, with what looks like press releases and newspaper articles, right? All of the assets that would make something look and feel like it, an event had actually occurred. If there's enough content and it all got released at the same time from what seems like a variety of sources, it would take us a while to unravel all of that to figure out it wasn't true. Take, for example, the current Israeli-Palestinian war. What if a bad actor created a deep fake event in that region that triggered a real reaction from one of the sides? Could that quickly escalate into a regional conflict? I think the answer is yes. Could that regional conflict put us into some type of catastrophic next world war? The end state of artificial intelligence is not cartoon images of CEOs. What's being built today, the foundation of the tech supercycle, this is the next era of computing, and it's going to be embedded into every single thing that we do all of the time. The products and services that you use as a consumer have already, in some way, been touched by the things that I've shown you, from concept to concrete, from these various different types of models, which makes AI the everything engine going forward. It is the foundation. So if AI is the everything engine, that engine is going to need data. And that brings us to the next set of trends, which is the connected ecosystems of things. This next set of trends comes from multiple parts of our trend report, so many different sections, mobility and robotics, advanced computing, and the built environment. Sometime in the next two years, AI will have run out of the internet. Um, we will have used up all of our high quality text and data, which will slow down AI's progress. So companies are inventing new devices to sell to us so they can get more data in. The problem is that most of the training data that we're using to train AI is online. Wikipedia, Reddit, books, spreadsheets, right? Stuff like that. So AI can't actually interact with us, with real people, normal real people, while it's learning. We have not yet created an in silico model of the real world. So we don't just need more data going forward. We need more types of data, which means that large language models aren't enough. Plus, it's a lot harder to get that information because everybody's starting to sue. The kind of data that we need going forward are sensory data, visual data, things like that. So what's coming after large language models are large action models. LLMs predict what to say next. LAMs predict what to do next, breaking down complex tasks into smaller pieces. That's why we are about to be surrounded by millions of sensors that are always on, also always on us. They are around us, and they can collect multiple streams of data at once. So the second general purpose technology, this other layer of the tech supercycle, has to do with the constellation of wearables, extended reality devices, the internet of things, the home of things, smart cars, smart offices, smart apartments, sensors everywhere. I call this connectables. This is the network of interconnected devices that communicate and exchange data to facilitate and fuel the advancement of artificial intelligence. We are about to see a Cambrian explosion of devices. And at the beginning, a lot of them are going to be pretty weird, like this AI-powered cat door. Um, it uses cameras and sensors to keep your cat outside until it drops the dead animal present. 
it, it made for you. So unless it drops the dead thing, uh, it will not allow the animal back into your house. This is weird, I hope you think. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, cat people are your own species of people. Um, but this is not the first time in history when we have seen weird technology. I ask you to remember the taser. The taser, the company that makes a stun gun uh, made this delightful combo unit. It's an MP3 player stun gun holster. So I guess while you're tasering some horrible person, you can listen to Celine Dion or whatever your jam is. Yes. For the next few years, you're going to see a lot of bizarre devices that nobody wants or needs until there's a normalization and we wind up with a suite of gear that we're actually going to wind up using every day. And at that point, the foundational layer of the tech supercycle will have faded into the background and just emerge ambiently when you need it, which is why there's a rush right now to create AI-first devices. They're meant to continuously learn from you in real time. MIT, IBM Watson, and some others, they came up with a way to process data that isn't text. So th they came up with a way to, to create a large action model, to use sensor data that's connected, uh, connected to a device that you would just have on you all the time in your pocket. So it's kind of like having your own little you know, personal neural network, a little tiny brain in your pocket, which is the promise of this thing. So this is the rabbit one, which is the beginning of large action models out in the real world. Basically, this thing is like a walkie-talkie with a screen, except that on the other side of it isn't a human, it's an AI. You hold down a button, and you ask it to do something, play a Spotify song, tell me the weather, and it will complete that action for you on your phone. It also has a training mode, so the more that you use it, the more that it learns about you. So, in a way, this thing is creating a large action model that's very tailored to you. And I don't know if this is exactly what the future is going to look like, but it shows us that the future looks very different than the present does today. But there is a connectable device that you're already familiar with, and it's this one. You are going to start to see face computers everywhere this year. This particular face computer comes from Apple. It's the Vision Pro. Now, we love and we hate, and we love to hate, this device. And maybe it'll turn out that the Vision Pro is a lot like the original iPhone, which is to say the OG iPhone was janky, and uh, it didn't really have a developer or an app ecosystem ready. But it went through a whole bunch of iterations and became the predominant you know, device that we, we all now use. So you might have to imagine a Vision Pro 18 iterations from now, kind of like the iPhone. Either way, it doesn't matter because it's already started to accelerate um, the advancement of XR devices overall. Google, Samsung, Qualcomm, they have a partnership to develop a real extended reality device on Android. Meta has its device in market, and I think yesterday there was a big brouhaha on one of the platforms with Zuckerberg saying, no, 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 Oculus is awesome. Um, Snap you know, has its platform. So these things are everywhere. Now, you might wonder, why am I insisting on calling this thing a face computer? And the answer is because it is a computer that you are strapping to your face. In fact, you have no idea what it is that you are, there's like one person in the back that just kind of went, um, what, you're, what you're strapping onto your face. The Vision Pro has 14 cameras that capture all different types of details in and out of the headset. LiDAR sensors that use light to measure distance and create a deep 3D map around you. Infrared cameras, accelerometers, gyroscopes, all the stuff. And they feed all of that information into a multi-dimensional space a spatial computing environment. The other devices, the other face computers that are coming to market this year, they're also all going to have a ton of sensors. Now, face computers are being designed from your point of view to help you interact with the world differently. From my point of view, they're being designed for other purposes as well. They are being designed to read your intentions. They can do that in part by reading and predicting the mov movement of your pupil. So my husband, Brian, is an eye doctor, uh, so I've got the inside scoop on this. But basically, when you think about something, your pupil starts reacting. So if you get excited, it 
changes sizes. You have no control over this. It is completely automatic, um, which means that your eye is going to move even before, potentially, you are aware of the thought you're about to have. OK? Yeah, now you know why we're talking about this. Your pupil will move sometimes before your, your body does, okay? which means that your face computer will know what you are going to do, what you are about to think, even before you do. Face computers are very expensive right now, so they're out of reach of most people, but that's going to change. And companies are highly motivated to build large action models and to get more types of data in. So what's eventually coming is a battle for face supremacy, companies vying to get you to wear their hardware. Another connectable, an enormous innovation that's coming to market next month is from a company called Humane. It's basically a brooch. Uh, a lot of people are very skeptical of this thing. It's a pin. Um, and before you compare this to the next Taser MP3 player combo unit cat thing, I actually think that this could represent a fundamental shift in how we use technology. So it's got a camera and a phone and a projector. It collects data all day long, and it also serves as an interface for your everyday life. It effectively builds a large action model about you. Now look. I don't think there's a massive conspiracy here. I don't think that the tech titans are in a war room somewhere planning their face supremacy you know, domination. I just think this is maybe the next stage of capitalism as the tech super cycle starts to really power up. We've incentivized these companies to get their, market, uh, their products into market as soon as possible. And there is no prize. There's no reward for the company with the most secure most privacy-assured device, the market doesn't reward preemptive problem solving. Companies make money through cycle upgrades and through services. So to grow revenue, they're going to keep making newer, better devices that you will pay for. And they're going to get you to pay for services, whether that's access to content or access to your large action model, whatever it may be. Um, you make the money as a company by getting to supremacy with the dominant brand and the dominant devices to the maximum number of people. I only had time to show you two devices. There are lots and lots coming for your body, for your office. OpenAI supposedly has a device in development for your home. So keep an eye on this space and also flip through the Tech Trends report because we explain a lot of them all the way throughout. This is really just the very beginning. Second set of scenarios. So again, this is going to build on artificial intelligence and now includes connectables. So let's combine what we know with the things that we cannot know to see where we get. What if you got instant summaries and analysis of anything, anytime you wanted? Let's say you work in insurance. And after listening to this presentation this morning, you're like, huh, all that stuff about large action models? That is going to make a huge impact on my industry. So I should probably take everything she just said, put it into a PowerPoint, and like run it up the chain and, and tell everybody else in my company, right? Because these would be really, really good notes uh, to share. And maybe you're highly offended by 20, too early 2000s fashion trends. And so maybe uh, your AI system would just automatically omit that part from my speech and just create the PowerPoint deck with every, all the good stuff, right? Uh, and that would be great. In this scenario, about an hour from now, you would have an automatic summary generated from this presentation of everything that matters to your company in insurance. You would hit a button, have it automatically make a PowerPoint, hit another button, and automatically send it to your boss. That is days worth of work that you will have done in an instant. And now, you get to go to the bar and drink extra margaritas. You're the hero, right? But I hate to ask this. What happens when, and it is when, not if, your large action model hallucinates? Hallucination is something we talk a lot about when it comes to large language models, right? Hallucinating is when you get nonsensical images, nonsensical words, thoughts, things like that. So what if your large action model hallucinates and it makes a PowerPoint that randomly includes Nazis 
since today I mentioned Nazis, and then throws in a tampon bush for good measure. <laughs> and automatically sends that to your boss instead. Well, friends, you are still drinking margaritas. Here's another scenario. What if connectables leads to social scoring? So again, let's assume that it's five to seven years from now, we're all wearing different devices, and that you all have connectables devices in your home. Let's say that there are now large action models that understand the world around you, your specific world as well. In this future, who might want that data? Now, assuming that you give consent, this could actually be a really good thing. Clothing manufacturers might know how actual bodies look and how they actually move, and they might change their sizes to represent what normal humans look like. That would be a good thing, right? Schools might have real, reliable models of how people spend their attention and how they learn, so this could improve education. So there's a lot of good things that could come, but I want to talk about banks. There are some researchers at the Technical University of Denmark that built a brand new model that predicts when you will die using artificial intelligence. Uh, now, what's interesting is they built this without large action models. It's probably not accurate. They're just using sort of generic information. However, if we think about all of the stuff that's coming to market, if I'm a bank considering whether to give you a 30-year mortgage for a house that you want to buy, it seems like I might want to build a large death model, no? Something like, like that might come in handy. Here's another fun, optimistic scenario. What if we accidentally create an even worse digital divide? Think about your groceries for a moment. Grocery stores and CPG companies today operate on razor-thin margins, and that is basically true everywhere in the world. So anything at all they can do to bump up their margins is really important. So what if they use dynamic pricing? This is where prices would change in real time in response to a trigger. What if in the future, there are no set prices for anything anymore? Instead, you get personalized prices for everything that you buy with the intention to get you to buy more things, to optimize for when you are likely to spend at that moment, to nudge you to buy more stuff. And what if dynamic pricing causes panic buying and inflation, which it will at scale? What if you can't afford your groceries anymore? What if to afford your groceries, you have to watch attention coupons? You go to the store, and the dynamic prices are too high for, let's say, soup. So you have to stop. You have to agree to share and upload your information, your data, with a CPG company that makes the soup, and watch a 30-second ad matched specifically to your large action model. And then you have to keep stopping because that was just soup. And you have a very long grocery list. You have to keep watching ads and sharing data the entire way through that you move through the store. And by the way, you are watching because our connectables are so powerful now, they know whether you're paying attention. No attention, no discount. Now, if you're affluent, Look, if you're rich, it just doesn't matter to you. Uh, you just turn off the attention coupons and you have total freedom of movement. This is actually the worst part. The worst part is that when we talk about privacy today, we need to broaden how we're thinking about uh, privacy. Because in this future, you know who's rich and who's poor by walking into the door of a grocery store. Because the rich people move around and buy what they want. Anybody who's financially struggling has to stand staring at the shelves, waiting so they can afford the groceries they need to buy. Let's talk about security and computer viruses. That'll be fun. The, the way that a computer virus, malware, ransomware spreads is by a bad actor sending an attack, somebody executing it. Um, so what if soon malware gets tied to our physical movement? What if somebody cracks your movement identity there is no possible, feasible way to change it. It's not a password. It is literally who you are. What if hackers invent an exploit called Surprise Ball, which is when a bunch of people see that you're wearing a face computer, and it looks like somebody throws a ball at you. You, you put your hand up to flinch automatically, and that unlocks malware. 
It's a spatial computing attack specifically designed to get you into moving into an attacker-defined location, and it gets activated while you're wearing your work face computer. So here's your key insight. Connectables enable ubiquitous, real-time data collection and AI training. All right, so we're at the end. Data from Connectables gives AI the data that it needs, but as we advance all of these systems and platforms, they're becoming a lot more power hungry. We have all heard about semiconductor chip shortages and challenges, right? There were all kinds of problems. There was problems in Taiwan, problems in Japan, so everybody wants AI now. We have a colossal problem on our hands going forward. Chips are very, very hard to come by. And we also know that Moore's law is starting to fail. We're hitting limits. So yes, it may be possible to get smaller and smaller things onto chips. It's also getting more and more expensive. So we need something new. Now, there are rumblings about alternative architectures out there. There's this new thing called Grok, which is not the Elon Musk Grok. This is a different Grok. That would allow GPT to run about 14 times faster than it does right now. And it would be wonderful if all of these things start to scale and whatever else really, really quickly. But the reality is we still need the materials. And for right now, we're stuck. Now, it may not seem like artificial intelligence and connectables have much to do with biotechnology, which is the third part of the tech supercycle, but it does. Here's the connection. The reason that biology connects to AI and connectables is because biology processes information in a way that silicon can't. In other words, if we're trying to build machines that can think and behave like we do, we literally need to make them more like us. So as last year, as much as last year was a big year for AI, it was actually a much, much bigger year for biotech. You just didn't hear a lot about that. We're going to see a ton of activity in the space going forward. There's an entire part of the trend report that just has to do with biotech that I would encourage you to take a look through. For our purposes today, two quick trends that are very, very important. The first has to do with materials science. Last week, a brand new AI model called Evo launched, and it uses the language of biology. So that's DNA, RNA, and proteins to make predictions to enable design uh, from molecules to full genomes. So it's kind of like ChatGPT, but instead for organisms, which means that coming after generative AI is generative biology. That's what's coming. So there's another company, another startup. Uh, you know how you write a prompt into ChatGPT you know, to write your emails for you? Well, you can do that with biology now. There's a startup uh, that will allow you to enter a prompt, determine the size, shape, function, whatever of the protein that you want, and then spits out the formula for it. Um, DeepMind built an AI tool, same basic concept, generative biology. It found 2.2 million new materials 380,000 of them are now in a lab being developed that could potentially power future technologies. So we can generate new biology, which means new therapeutics, new ways to manage climate change, new ways to deal with the global food shortage. But the question that I would ask you is, does this help our semiconductor chip problem? And that takes me to the, to the final trend. Sometime in the next decade, AI will be working alongside OI, organoid intelligence. So what's an organoid? It's basically a tiny replica of tissue that functions and is structured like the organ. Um, so basically, scientists start with a special type of stem cell. You can think of it as a blank. They put them in a gelatinous mixture. They start adding molecules to nudge it to become that type of whatever it is, uh, heart cells, brain cells, whatever, and then it grows. This on the screen is a brain organoid. It's real. It was developed by some researchers at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. In 2021, some researchers in Melbourne at the Cortical Lab Institute, they made a miniature brain that worked like a computer. So they did something like this. They made the organoid, they attract, attacked, attached it to some electrodes, um, and, then, and then they taught it how to play Pong, the, the old school video game. That's what it looked like. So organoid intelligence, or OI, uses biological materials, brain cells, for information processing leveraging their inherent capabilities beyond 
uh, silicon-based systems. So what is on the horizon, my friends? Are biocomputers made out of human brain cells. This is not science fiction. This has already been done. A few weeks ago, there was a biocomputing system made out of living human brain cells that learned how to recognize one human voice out of 240 people's voices um, using audio clips and some other AI technology. So look, it's going to be a while before OI can compete with traditional computers using AI, but eventually, Biological computers are going to be faster, more efficient, and more powerful than we have today, and they will take a fraction of the amount of energy uh, in order to operate. So here's your key insight. Biotechnology will move us past silicon-based computing systems. And that takes us to our final set of scenarios. So what happens when we combine AI and connectables and biotechnology? What if, instead of shrinking more transistors onto chips, we grow our computers instead. We grow them rather than build them. Well, if we're going to grow computers, the organoids are going to need to come from somewhere or from somebody. This GPU from NVIDIA is state of the art right now for AI. It gets made in a factory. I don't know who made it. It doesn't really matter. Would that be different, though, if it was a biocomputer grown from human cells rather than manufactured in a factory? What if? Instead of anonymous stem cells, we could order a biocomputer made from somebody, a particular person's brain cells. Like, you could choose out of a catalog. You could see their IQ. You could see their academic achievements. What if your company orders a biocomputer from this guy, from his cells? What if he's like really, really nice? And he's published 200 academic papers. He's a revered mathematician. He is perfect. He's a ginger. He's perfect in every possible way. But he's also a little racist. What if you go on vacation? Do you have to hire a computer sitter to feed and water your computer? All right, so we've gone through a bunch of emerging tech trends, biotech, connectables, and AI. These make up the three general purpose technologies that are the technology super cycle. I spent a lot of time today going through basically only catastrophic scenarios, because without intervention, that is what I see coming at us. We've been told for decades it's not the tech that could lead to catastrophic outcomes. Tech isn't bad or good. It's how the people use the technology. Well, what about the people building the technology and funding the technology and their companies and the increasing control that they exert in our everyday lives? And that brings me back to these guys. The technology super cycle, <coughs> it's concentrating right power right now among a dangerously small group of people who hold significant power and influence in society, in government, in politics, in our economies. Because they control our tech resources, because they've amassed great wealth, and because they control how we communicate ideas with each other. Some of them are famous for buying private islands <coughs> because regulations don't matter if there's no government, if you're on totally private land. Some of them are developing in economies, are working in developed economies in places called special economic zones, which are basically regulation-free little parts of cities where you can run biotech experiments, you can test new gene therapies, you can build new types of computers. Saving humanity is really cool right now. Pretty soon, the tech messiahs are going to try and save us from the technology super cycle. The tech messiahs each have their own unique spin on how to save us. They call it effective altruism. They call it techno-optimism. But from the outside, it looks a heck of a lot more like free market techno-authoritarianism. And I'm not OK with that. We don't need someone to save us. We just need to do better planning for the future. All right, I told you at the beginning, we're going to end on a high note. We are a little bit over because of some technical challenges. I know a few of you have to leave. For those of you who can stay, I have specific recommendations, because I do not want you to leave here feeling FUD anymore. So first, government. Here's what you need to do, and it's not going to be popular. 
Our elected leaders need to look forward, not backwards. I don't care how old they are. You need to, you need to establish a department of transition. We are Gen T. You need to do this now. That department should stop building models. What industries will the tech super cycle impact? And does your company, or how is your country's GDP going to be impacted? This isn't guesswork. You don't need to hire some enormous professional services firm. You just need to get your act together and do this work. The Department of Transition should create kind of something like a hospice for business. It's time to just acknowledge that certain businesses and jobs are going to go away and to create a soft landing so that doesn't cripple your economy. Instead, look at the fields where a human will definitely be needed for the long term. Plumbers, electricians, dental hygienists. Stop insisting that everybody go to a four-year college and get a degree and remind people that the trades are equally as valuable as, and as important. Um, and when it's time for somebody to make the transition, give them a tax-deferred bank account. Create a way for that family to continue to survive as they transition into the job that they're going to have next. Businesses, you need to do something called mapping your value network. This is something that everybody in this room can do. So a value network is, a con is something we teach in business school. Basically, it's your company and all the, the partners uh, and all of the different entities in your ecosystem that co-create value with you. So at its zenith, this was BlackBerry's value network. Obviously, it's not totally that. This is a tiny slide. But um, you can see here that there were you know, the telecommunications companies and the hardware manufacturers. When BlackBerry innovated and advanced and created value, they all created value together. The problem is, and this is important for those of you at successful companies, value networks are not static. They continue to evolve. They're always in motion. So BlackBerry failed because it ossified. It completely missed the iPhone, and it missed these two core areas that were developing, uh, video and music. They failed to see that the phone's new value proposition was not just for work, because they weren't doing this value network mapping. So a lot of companies have never done this before. This is something you can and should do because the technology super cycle will completely change what your value network is going forward. If you can do this, you will effectively slow time down and see disruption before it happens and enable you to create value going forward. That brings me to the true end and to you. Uh, my recommendation to you is simple. I need you to fight for our future. We can and should be prosperous. Brazil, Germany, Japan, all of us, all of our businesses, we can be successful and resilient. The tech, tech super cycle can be a net positive. We can leave humanity in a better place. We can transition into something truly amazing. But we got to get to work. So this is your plan. First of all, download everything in this folder. Um, this is the Tech Trend Report. It's also all of the key slides from this presentation. Okay, you can take what I just did and share it. Share it with your coworkers. You can represent it in your companies, and I actually want you to do that. There's also an eight-page explainer in there on what a value network is with explanations on how to do this on your own. You can and should do that, and some of our core frameworks as well. Okay, two more seconds. Yes, almost. Okay, um, speaking of trends, final thing. For the first year, um, we're actually going to show you how we do our trends uh, and how we put together this report. So my colleagues and I are doing a master class every day starting today. Uh, we've, we are going to take you through four modules, soup to nuts, how do we do this work and how do you get to strategy. Um, if you attend all four sessions, there's two every day so that we can get a maximum number of people in, you will get a credential uh, that, that doesn't expire and you can continue to take with you. So that is it. Uh, I need you to join us because the future cannot wait, and the tech super cycle is here. Remember, please, when you see an orange shirt person, a staff member, anybody who's at South By, tell them thank you. I thank you. Thank you for being patient. And I will see you next year.